I think we are live. Yeah. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. A uh, uh, warm welcome to all of you, whichever part of the world you're in. So I should say, perhaps not just good evening, but good morning or good afternoon, whichever part of the world you're in. Welcome to the eighth edition of the Urban Lens uh, Film Festival. Um, it's a real pleasure having you all uh, as part of this festival. Uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this is for the second year in a row that we've had uh, the festival online. Uh, for the first uh, six editions of the festival, uh, it usually actually takes place in the city of Bangalore and uh, Delhi in India. Uh, but this year, for second year in a row, we've had uh, the festival online. Um, but what this also means that uh, many of you in different geographies across the world can actually join us in watching the films. And it's not just those living in the city of Bangalore and Delhi. So um, do register and do watch all the wonderful films. Um, this year, the festival, a brief introduction to the festival. This year, the festival, we have uh, three, four curated sections. Um, the first section uh, is called COVID and the city. Um, all over the world and especially in India, we've been through uh, two waves of the COVID pandemic and it's in the midst of us. So there's a section of films that actually uh, looks at how have filmmakers actually engaged, uh, thought of this idea of, uh, of the pandemic and uh, the kind of works that they produced. Uh, the second section is called uh, Conflict and Cinema. And um, what we've done in this section is taken films uh, which have which look at various points uh, in history across time. So starting from actually the Second World War and looked at how are filmmakers um, are thinking about things that happen in their society, especially um, horrific events historically that have happened. So this is a section called Conflict and uh, Cinema. Uh, the third section uh, is was is called City and Beyond, which uh, basically there are films uh, of different genres that look at the urban condition. Uh, that's the third section. And uh, we have a fourth section, which basically um, looks at films made by uh, student filmmakers from different film schools in India. There's a new section that we've added this year called Filmmakers in Focus. Uh, of which we have uh, uh, we have Tamara Stepanyan, who we're going to be listening to today, um, German filmmaker Philip Schaffner and American filmmaker Joshua Oppenheimer. 
And one of the main reasons of actually starting this section is that very often we watch films and, you know, we speak about the film and then we go away. But we were very interested in looking at this idea of practice itself. So, in fact, in Urban Lens, we have a history of actually speaking to filmmakers and what their practice is. So, in some ways, the filmmakers in focus section is a continuation of that to look at what is this practice of filmmaking. Uh, and as importantly, what are the contexts um, in which these films are emerging? and how have filmmakers themselves changed uh, over the journey of their filmmaking process. So it's a real pleasure today to have with us today um, Tamara Stepanyan. There are three films of Tamara's that are actually being screened at the festival um, this year at Urban Lens. So I would really encourage you to go watch it. The festival is, um, um, is there from 18 to 21st um, November. And Samina uh, Mishra uh, is going to be in conversation with Tamara Stepanyan. Samina is what I'd like to think an old comrade of the Urban Lens yes. Film Festival. She's been part of the festival in different ways. So thank you, Samina. Um, um, uh, for being part of this festival. And before I hand it over to Samina, I'm going to do a brief introduction to both Tamara and uh, Samina. Uh, Tamara Stepanyan was born in Armenia. During the breakdown of the Soviet Union in the early 90s, she moved to Lebanon. After studying and working in Lebanon, she pursued her studies at the National Film School of Denmark under the supervision of Arne Bru. Embers is the first feature documentary of Tamara that won the Best Documentary Award at Busan International Film Festival um, and we're showing this film at, the, uh, at Urban Lens. For 11 years now, she's been working and living in France where she's already made two feature documentary, those from the shore and village of women. Again, both these films are being screened at the Urban Lens Film Festival. Her films have won prestigious awards around the world um, and um, she's kind of um, shown all over actually. Um, and she's made a number of films that have been shown in prestigious festivals like Locarno, Busan, La Rochelle, Boston, Leipzig, um, to name a few. Uh, Tamara also teaches film at two schools in Paris. A very warm welcome to you, Tamara, and we're really looking forward to listening to you and, uh, and, and you know, how you think of films and how you've made the films that you've made. Uh, she will be in conversation with Samina Mishra. Samina Mishra is somebody who actually wears many hats. She's a documentary filmmaker, writer, and a teacher based in New Delhi with a special interest in media for and about children. Her work uses the lens of childhood, identity, and education to reflect the experiences of growing up in India. Her recent work includes Jamlo Walks, a picture book that tells the story of the migrants walking back home during the COVID-19 lockdown in March 2020. For those who, of you who haven't actually read the book, I would really urge you to buy it and read it. Uh, you must. And the second book was uh, Nida Finds a Way, a chapter book for early readers that follows a young girl as she explores the world around her, including the anti-CA and RC public protest at Schattenbach. And a new film of hers called Happiness Class that recently actually released, which is a documentary that explores the idea of happiness seen through the happiness curriculum introduced in the Delhi government schools in 2018. She's currently teaching at the IB Diploma Program in Film at Pathway School, Noida. Samina also collaborates on Torchlight, a web journal on libraries and a bookish love, curates for Half Ticket, the children's section at Mambi Mumbai Film Festival, and runs the Magic Key Center for Arts and Childhood, a virtual resource center for children as well as adults working with and for children. Uh, welcome, Samina, um, and I hand it over to you now uh, to start the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Subhashree, and uh, thank you, the entire Urban Lens team, for putting this together. Uh, I feel privileged that I got a chance to watch the three films uh, in advance, and I am so, so delighted uh, to be doing this conversation with Tamara Stepanyan. Um, the three films that I've seen, and I hope that all of you will, uh, I feel they provide us with this uh, very intimate window through which to look at um, modern Armenian history. Um, I knew very little about uh, this uh, small and beautiful uh, Caucasian country for most of my life until I was fortunate to travel there in the summer of 2019. And um, I was uh, straight off like so struck by first its natural beauty, you know, it's a sort of stunning mise-en-scene of monasteries, you know, against um, uh, uh, sort of natural landscapes of, you know, lakes and mountains. Um, but then there's also the 
the other side there's there are there are decrepit sort of uh, apartment housing with sort of peeling walls and um, you know rusting soviet era trucks and then i would turn a corner and then there would be a shiny new building or a trendy cafe and you know a bnb with sort of all the modern amenities so it was a kind of combination of rust and possibilities and uh, it presented a kind of an old country that was perhaps looking towards a, a new future and uh, you know walking in um, tamara walking in the small towns of dilijan and sevan very often i would feel like you know i'd been transported into an east european film of a long time ago and i feel that perhaps that too that that feeling of being in an east european film is perhaps a reminder of armenia's painful um, history of war occupation genocide and a contested identity and nationhood and i think that your films bring a very gentle intimate gaze to this um, history and how it lives in the present both in uh, the armenian armenians living in the country and the armenians who are sort of scattered across the globe like the seeds of the pomegranate which is um, such an important uh, symbol in armenian culture so uh, i really strongly urge you to see the three films embers made in 2012 those from the shore in uh, made in 2017 and village of women uh, made in 2019 because together the three films present the recent history of armenia through the lives of pastoral urban and exiled armenians with so much love so thank you so much for this uh, feast uh, tamara i thought perhaps um, it would be nice to begin uh, the conversation by talking about the idea of the journey because all three films evoke this idea so you know i thought like the personal journeys yours those of the characters that you've met in the course of making the films and uh, also what those journeys what journey what the idea of the journey means in the history of um, armenia so you know what drew you to this idea of the journey did it come to you instinctively or perhaps was it something subconscious or did you know some particular narratives um, drive you in this direction maybe you could just talk to us a little bit about that Yeah thank you Samina thank you very much for this uh, introduction which is very flattering for me <laughs> uh absolutely the journey i mean we armenian people we are known to be um scattered all over the world so the the word journey uh is a very uh, representative of the armenian identity because since mm. 1915 since the genocide and all the wars and all the massacres that we've lived the armenian people were always on the road towards somewhere and so and also the 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 feeling of exile uh is part of the journey for armenian people and um perhaps as it's also very personal for me uh since i left armenia at a very young age at the age of uh, 12 i took this journey uh with uh, of course my parents and uh, at the time towards lebanon and then i took a- again other journeys towards korea towards denmark uh, towards now france and it's true that being a, a kind of a uprooted um uprooted person uh, it it even accentuates more this um, journey what you talked about and how uh, i kind of for me it's a very important to uh, to move and to also meet characters and to help them move with me along my films mm. Mm. i don't know if it's clear so, so the f- the film I, is also I, the film is also a journey the 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 course. process of the film and Absolutely. For, for for example, if I take embers, uh, embers, uh, I I went, uh, I, I left. Uh, I was at the time living in Lebanon. I left Lebanon. I went to Armenia. I had a broken tripod, an old camera, and I didn't care. And I knew I just wanted to make this film, and I needed to go and trace this history that this old people, the friends of my grandmother, who who went through war. and how this because for me they were really the last uh, remnants of a time of a soviet armenia and now there mm. no one of them none of them is alive today and in, mm. it was also for me important to trace their journey and to kind of create a dialogue between their journey and the today tamara's journey and mm. how they meet and how they dialogue and how they, they 
this is an example for embers, but I could also give an example for those from the shore. It's it's a bit in the same, yeah. I think, um, structure. Well, even yeah. if it's quite different for each film. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very strongly present in uh, all the three films. So how did you come to filmmaking? I mean, you've spoken a little bit about, you know, the journey. And also, I mean, we heard in the in the bio, in the introduction, you know, um, that you have sort of been away from Armenia. But how did you come to filmmaking? And, you know, uh, uh, did you do you think that, you know, your choices have been, uh, I mean, I'm sure they have been, but in what ways have they been impacted by, you know, all of... Um, these experiences of leaving and um, being on a journey. I grew up in um, I grew up in an artist's family. Uh, my grandparents worked in cinema. My father was a theatre director. My mother is a, a cello player, musician. So, kind of art, cinema, theatre, music was really omnipresent in my daily life. Mm. Uh, and how I always dreamed to become an actress. I didn't want to, first, I didn't, for me, cinema was not an option. But I always dreamt mm -hmm. to become an actress because I was quite, very much fascinated by my father <laughs> as all little girls. And I was also very much fascinated by, he had a company of theater and all these actors and actresses and all this kind of very burlesque life they had because I used to spend a lot of time with them. And I was looking at them and thinking, well, it's, it's, it's just, um, it must be amazing to be an actress. And um, when I was seven, uh, an Armenian film director made the casting and I acted in his film. Oh. And I remember this scene. Uh, yeah, I was seven. <laughs> and I remember this scene where, uh, you know, back, to, back in the days, it was the big 35 millimeter cameras with the lights and it was a big production. And we were supposed to uh, act, the, all the film is by children, uh, but we're acting war it's war but acted by children and mm -hmm. uh i was um and suddenly they switched off the lights and they put the lights for camera and the camera started rolling and i was fascinated by this kind of blackness and the light and how i kind of trans was transported into another universe into another mm -hmm. reality and this, I was so impressed and I was like, oh, it, this is just amazing to make films. And for me, it was quite clear that, uh, I, and it was also in the unconscious as later uh, I grew up, that I wanted so much to create this other world. I wanted, I didn't want to be in front of it. I didn't care anymore. For me, it was not interesting to be an actress anymore, but I wanted to create this other world to create uh, this kind of magical, let's say, world. So, uh, and then as I grew up, I, um, I I told my parents I wanted to do cinema. They were against it, of course, because they're artists and they think that uh, cinema doesn't make us live. <laughs> but I insisted and I insisted and I insisted and I got what I wanted, so. <laughs> So it's really nice to hear you say, tell us all this, because uh, I can see how some of all of this actually permeates your work, you know, the music. And I want to talk to you later about that, you know, the music and all of that. Um, so I actually, I, I thought it might be nice to uh, show a clip from Embers, because uh, I do want to talk a little bit about, you know, how you have used mise-en-scene in it. So there's a clip, uh, perhaps we can play that. And sure. then we can talk about it, yeah? Ես փոքր ժամանակ իմ սենյակը ճունեի տատիկիս կողքն է եկնում այդ սենյակում կարիերկու անգով էին մեկը իրեն էր 
Ես է բորիս պապիկինը, բայց նա մահացի դեր դեր իմ ծնվելու ծարաջը։ Նիշերները միշտ խոսում էինք, բաբուլյայիս հետ, տարվեր բաների մասին, արորյայի, անցյալի, տխաների, և մեկ մեկ նույն իսկ ինձ իմ հարաբերությունների մասին, խիստ կիներ, ուժեղ, բայց շատ բարին, կարոտել եմ շատ սենյակը, բիշերային մեր զրույցները, իրեն, близкими подругами, ну до того близкими, что когда умер муж у Томы, твой дедушка, первый звонок в три часа ночи был к нам, и мы в три часа ночи поехали в Киев. И теплые отношения с Томой у нас сохранились до самой ее смерти. So you said that as a child you wanted to the magic of cinema was that you wanted to create another world, right? And uh, in a way, you, it's not that you are, uh, you are actually creating images of the world that you are in, that you, that you inhabit, or some worlds that you are in that you inhabit. And yet, the way that you are representing them, and I think the way that you use the mise-en-scene has a very special quality to it, you know. Um, it is extremely powerful, I think, that in the way all of the various ideas and also emotions that it evokes, you know, there is sort of nostalgia of absence and loss, things gone by. You know, in this uh, clip that we saw, the, the, the contrast between the sort of cold forbidding outdoors and the warmth of the interior spaces and the interview frames also, some of them are extremely painterly, you know. Um, so I've, mm. I thought if you could speak a little bit about this, that uh, how you came to, you know, uh, choose this uh, sort of stylistic uh, approach. Of course. Um, indeed, when I started preparing embers, I, I started calling up the, the friends of my grandmother and I started to visit their houses. Hmm. And me, um, the way I work, I, I'm, I'm, I let myself to be very much inspired by the spaces because in a way I had in my mind the way I would like to work uh, visually. But uh, this cannot be defined if we haven't seen the space we want to film. So mm. when I started going to their houses, uh, I, was, I, I had really the feeling that every time I enter into somebody's house, I'm transported into this colorful, uh, beautiful light, uh, all these windows like with the curtains and the colors. And I felt that it was like a painting for me. And I, yeah. and I, and I realized quite early that uh, how I would like to film these men and women. So, of course, there's a, a stylistic approach, which is quite, uh, was thought in my head. But I also am somebody that I love to use the instinct. So the, mm. what I felt when I was there on, on the, uh, in this location, and for me, it was very instinctive to choose. I always put the characters next to a window. So mm. I had the window light. For me, it was important to have natural light. So kind of half of the face was lit naturally and the other half was lit with a little light that was artificial next to them. And then I, I tried to create this contrast between the, the kind of uh, kind of create two worlds, the, the, the what used to be with what is today, kind of try to always put them in this in between because these are characters that are 
in a way in between they're 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 from the past but they live today and they cannot really associate themselves to today so they're, they're kind of hidden so that's why you have to always the feeling it's a bit like uh, hidden from the between the light and the dark so it was always to create this distance and uh, basically it was uh, for me it was also very clear that i would like to film to give them space so the characters mm. are filmed from distance you don't have a lot of close-ups because, if, for example, in my village of women, I work a lot with the close shots. Here, I had really, I, I wanted to give them the space and the time to 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 be. I didn't want to be. I, I didn't want to come too close. I had the feeling I need to give them their own distance, and I think mm -hmm. it, it was important for the film. Um, yeah, and, and for me, it was quite clear. Uh, from the, and, and, but it, what I was inspired from was their houses, was their mm -hmm. homes, was their uh, uh, walls, uh, the, the decoration they have, the vases they have, the, their colors, uh, their faces, so expressive. Yeah, it's, there's so much texture in the film because of that and how you've used it and the lighting particularly, you know. Uh, in fact, the interview frames are, you know, sometimes they're like, you know, portraits by Vermeer or somebody like that. They're framed so, so beautifully. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so um, also, uh, Embers, you know, uh, this idea of because, you know, you're talking to people of that generation of the Soviet era. And, you know, I did encounter this actually in some conversations when I was in Armenia, this, you know, the tension between like uh, many people would say that, you know, uh, that the sort of authoritarianism of the Soviet era, they're really glad that that is gone and they've gotten rid of that. But at the same time, they would say that in some very material ways, you know, things were better in terms of livelihood or um, education or, you know, how children from every family got to do, you know, sports or culture, or learn music or things like that. So this, uh, and you know, we see it in embers, but we also see this this tension between, you know, the need for sort of individual freedom, but also the support of a collective, you know, uh, we see that also in some ways in Village of Women. So I was wondering that yes. what was your understanding of this, you know, this uh, tension and these two ideas, and there is no easy answer, I'm sure, but I wondered, what was your understanding of this um, before making the films and did it evolve? Uh, through your journey, you know, through perhaps even from film to film. Absolutely. Uh, it's interesting that you talk about this, Amina, because um, it's true that it's a, until today, I can tell you that I'm quite torn up about uh, this, uh, ide this ideology because, yes, you hear a lot of, um, let's say, elder people who tell you, oh, back in the Soviet days, it was better. We had the electricity, we had education. People were more in a kind of comfortable life. Indeed. But it's true that, uh, that uh, there was not freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. There was repression. There was a Soviet uh, very strict. Uh, yes. So I, what I understood, of course, is uh, maybe it's not a clear answer. But uh, yes, there is a certain nostalgia for the time. There is a certain nostalgia for what Armenia used to be, because the problem is that Armenia, unfortunately, is not managing to uh, exist exist independently and in a kind of a strong way. That's the problem. Mm. After the break of Soviet Union, Armenia got independence, which is great. But freedom and all this kind of what we call iron curtains were removed. So yes, very good. But in this independence, they didn't manage to recreate strong in a strong way. That's why in Armenia today, there is a war and there is again a war and there will be wars because we're not strong enough, unfortunately. We're not strong mm -hmm. enough. Our politics is not strong enough. Um, and that's why if today, for example, back in the days, people used to uh, work. There was no problem of work. People would have great education. There was no problem mm -hmm. of education. The hospitals, the everything was on a very good standard. And that's what people mm -hmm. miss, I think. And I understand. And in a way, me, also, me too, I'm, I'm torn sometimes. Sometimes I'm mm. torn. I say, yes, of course, back in the days, it was a uh, dictatorship, all this, all that. But people would have were more peaceful. But anyway, I don't have any preference for anything. It's not my opinion that counts. But people, you can feel even in the village of women, 
village of women, you can feel yeah. the elder people have a lot of nostalgia for this time. Because what is yeah. their life yeah. now? They start at 11 in the morning, they put the vodka and they start drinking and it's not from happiness. It's not from yeah. happy life they do that. And all the men that are working in Russia to send uh, money home, what is this? Why is this? Because there's not enough jobs in Armenia. Because mm. if back in the days there were enough jobs in Armenia, there were factories, there was an infra infrastructure that was working. What do we have today? Little, mm. unfortunately. Mm. But, uh, that's it's, it's a quite complicated uh, topic. Until yeah, now, for yeah. me, I, I still haven't resolved it. So. <laughs> Yeah, no, I can understand. It is a, uh, I mean, uh, I, I think it leads us to my next question. You, know, you spoke about exile also earlier. And, the, you know, your work is um, sort of, it references exile uh, quite a lot. Um, yes. And I, I, it made me think of also, you know, so this idea of uh, home, because exile throws up the idea of home. But the way that the world, the way the world is today, it's uh, less and less possible for place to be the idea of home. You know, it is uh, sort of historical roots are being questioned in many parts of the world, and those who have more power, they um, seek to dictate where others can or cannot live. Um, it's happening also here in India. So it made me think about, you know, like so, what is this idea of home, and how do we carry it then? And um, I, I wondered if you could, from your personal experience and your engagement with so many different kinds of um, characters, uh, what it tells you about, you know, finding a sense of home. Um, well, I think that uh, if I start from myself, I, uh, I spend a lifetime searching for home. And I think that can be felt in my films. Uh, because I think that once you have been uprooted from your home, which was Armenia back in the days, and then you keep your life searching for a home. And basically, I, I have the feeling that the characters I have met in my films, in my life, in my films, uh, often search home. Not all of them, of course, because some of them, for example, the, the characters in Embers, uh, they were more or less good in their homes. But also in the in the meantime, they were they were lost in this new Armenia and the Armenia that used to be. So or the characters in the those from the shore, they're like me a bit. They were in search of a new home. They came to France, they left everything behind with their few luggages, and they were there trying to reconstruct this home. But I have the feeling, or village of women, it's men who leave home while women try to keep this home try to conserve this home. Yeah. Um, but what, I mean, what comes to me, I think it's a quite complicated uh, issue because I think that the home is something that we can temporarily establish, but we can never really say, this is home and it stops there. Mm. And for me, it doesn't work mm. like this. For me, I'm all the time in the search. Of course, I have my home. I live in Paris. I like it. I'm comfortable. But I see that I'm always in search of something. I'm always in trying to kind of put my little roots where I am. And it's not always mm. easy. But I think that in my films, this is something that's explored. The characters who kind of live in this yes. nostalgia of a past, who search for a new home, who search for a new start. Yeah, yeah. No, um, I'm, I, I, perhaps it is something that, uh, you know, this idea now of rootedness, perhaps yeah. home cannot now be linked to that idea of rootedness any longer, no? And maybe... Uh, it is also something which is fluid and dynamic and, you know, we have to sort of make peace with that and, you know, find other other ways of defining that uh, exactly. for ourselves. Exactly. I think this would be a good uh, place to see the clip from uh, uh, those from the show. Those from the show. But I, I just want to also ask, uh, say to people who are watching that do please um, ask if you have questions that you'd like to ask Tamara, please do share those because we will take them. Um, so, yeah, we'll go to the clip, but yeah, I'm hoping that there will be questions from the audience, though I have many more uh, to ask you. So let's, we, let's watch the clip. Vous êtes quel pays euh, Je suis origine d'Arménie. Mm -hmm. Et combien de temps vous êtes en France Je suis euh, trois ans ici, en trois, France. Oui. Trois. trois ans. Euh, 
ça c'est un récépissé de mon mari. Oui. Ça c'est moi mm -hmm. et deux, les enfants. Deux enfants. Et les enfants sont ici en France Eh oui. oui, oui. Vous pouvez ouvrir le dossier Oui, oui. Et pourquoi il n'y a pas la photo Photo de qui euh, Votre enfant. Enfant Oui. Euh, si vous avez besoin de photo, je oui, fais un photo. Oui, oui. Oui. D'accord. Vous, euh, vous ouvrez le dossier et après je vous donne la photo. Ça va, <coughs> madame. Vous Ça après, va? Vous après, oui, euh, donnez le, les photos de votre enfant et après c'est complet et vous pouvez attendre quelques temps et après. C'est bon pour vous. Et qu'est-ce que je fais maintenant Vous me donnez rendez-vous Oui. Vous... Quel jour euh, Vous demandez à Koy que là-bas, on va donner rendez-vous et après, vous revenir aussi. So I, of course, wanted to ask you why you chose to work in black and white for this film. But uh, we have a, a question from uh, an audience member, Kevil, and he'd like to ask you what some of your inspirations were for this idea of duality that you spoke, you know, the idea of uh, natural light and artificial um, light, for example. So perhaps you could uh, respond to him first and then maybe lead into why sure. you chose black and white. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit what I said, um, Keval, a while ago. It was about to create this kind of two worlds they live in. The, work, the, the world of the past and the world of the present. So it's to kind of create the, this character that is stuck into two, in between two spaces, let's say, the past and the present. Because for me, Embers is really a film that is all about the past and the present. So I kind of try to solve this by light. Hmm. And uh, it, it, I mean, I'm not sure if that's what he meant, but I'm wondering if, uh, you know, were there any particular sort of uh, inspirations in terms of image making, you know? Um, uh, well, when I work, uh, it's also my way of working. Uh, I am much inspired from paintings. Hmm. Uh, painting for that. me is a big, big source of inspiration. And I think you can feel that in, in my works. Yes. Uh, so often people tell me your, your, your frame looks like a painting. And I think Absolutely. that since very, yeah, since quite childhood, I've been inspired by, uh, by painters. 
different painters, uh, in European, not only uh, Armenian too. Uh, and uh, mm. definitely, definitely, it's it's a uh, it's. I think it's quite unconscious for me, but I, I spend mm. a lot of time looking into art books, mm. and not mm. not not. Because, like, for example, I, I have a film. Okay, now I'm going to look into art books, be inspired. No, yeah, yeah. it's something that is part of my daily life. Looking into films, looking into art books, going to exhibitions. And that's why sometimes I people tell me, aren't you fed up to live in Paris? I say, no, it's a, it's a very hectic city. It's very active and there's too much noise. But for me, it's very important to be part of the cultural life, to go all the time mm. to museums, to spend a lot of time looking into paintings, looking at the light, uh, even in just it, 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 it's a source of inspiration, definitely. Well, we can see it even in this clip that we showed uh, from those from the show. I mean, it's black and white, but how you have used light, particularly in those landscape um, uh, images, it is so, yeah. so stunning. So why did you choose to work in black and white in this film? Um, for me, uh, the, the story of black and white is a bit uh, funny, but I will tell you, of course. Um, the idea was there because I wanted to kind of uh, place the characters in, uh, in a kind of um, black and white world, let's say, where there are not mm -hmm. much colors because these people who come and ask for asylum, the asylum seekers, they arrive in a way they give everything they have which means they get rid of all the papers they have and then they wait for one year two years three years depends and then they ask their new identity so in a kind in a way for me it was really like these people are really in a black or white life let's say in a black or white reality there are not much palette of colors in their life but this was the idea behind. When I arrived to Marseille, uh, the Marseille in the south of France, I was stuck by the light. And also that's mm -hmm. why I say for me, it's very important to go to the places that I'm going to film uh, in order to write, in order to be inspired, in order to, to, I cannot just, it's not only in the head. For me, documentary is so much inspired by reality, by, by the spaces where these characters live. Uh, and so much is changed all, all the time. It's because when I'm, I'm when I'm on, on the spot when I'm doing my film, and and when I arrived to Marseille, I came out of the uh, train station, train station Saint Charles, and there was this kind of chiaroscuro light in front of mm. me. There's, the sun was so strong, and I and I look at this. I said, of course, it has to be black and white. There is no discussion about it. And mm -hmm. I started walking in the city and I was walking and the more I was walking, the more I was looking at the walls and the kind of the shade that it creates with the light. And I was looking at the sea and, and, and I thought, no, of course it has to be black and white. And then I started mm -hmm. filming. I was doing uh, like uh, location scouting and uh, I was meeting characters and I was filming. And then came my producer in the evening several days after and she said Tamara would you like to show me something you've done I said of course said Natalie with pleasure and then I show her black and white images and my producer was unhappy she said but oh. okay now you show me black and white can you show me the color version I said I don't have color she said what do you mean you don't have color I said but I filmed black and white this is rare because on my camera I had to put option black and white something we almost never do but yeah, yeah. I did it in order, nobody for me, I didn't want anybody to ask me questions and I, don't, I didn't want even myself to doubt. So mm -hmm. I said, I'm going to film black and white. Nobody can change that and it's black and white. And I also thought that to film the water, the sea in black mm -hmm. and white must be so strong. It's the feel. It's, it's also an intuition I had. So, of course, the idea was there to place the characters and all what I explained, but it was much more accentuated by the light that I saw in Marseille. Mm. I love that you, you know, uh, everything in your film and everything that you're talking about, there is always there's some intellectual uh, response going on there. But I love that you allow yourself that space to actually just tap into what you're feeling and that instinct and, you know, respond from that. And that's so nice because I think that that gives your film so much heart. You know, um, it's really nice to hear you talk about <laughs> <I hope> that. 
Um, I, I had one more question about um, those from the show. Uh, I felt that, you know, of course, it also has conversations, but it is a quieter film than the other two. You know, uh, it, the conversations the are short? there. Yes, yes. Because I feel like the conversations are a little more restrained than uh, particularly Village of Women, of course, which we'll talk about. But um, what I mean was, and also the fact that you have filmed with, you know, this, uh, it seems like a theater kind of workshop um, that we saw just now. So what was your process for this film? Do you feel it was different in some ways from the others? All my films are different in the sense mm -hmm. that when I start a project, uh, as, as, I, as we talked, uh, don't, of course, there's the, the intellectual work and then comes the instinctual work and then it comes the research. Because making a film, it, it's not for me, it's not an equation A plus B equals C and then sometimes A plus B plus C equals D. No, for me, it was really uh, every film that I start, every project, every idea that I have, it's really a process of research and a process of work. And sometimes this process can end up in a documentary film. Sometimes it can end up in a fiction. Well, now I'm, I'm pre preparing a fiction film, for example. Yeah. Um, I have another project, which is an archive. So it, it, it's, um, it's a process. And during each uh, film, each project that I'm preparing, there is a lot of uh, research to understand what I want to do with this one. It's never clear in the beginning that, oh, I want to make this because I want to do this, this, this. No. It, for example, I knew that uh, with the, those from the shore, I, I wanted to create these landscapes, this kind of always, almost um, suspended time. Mm -hmm. I knew that my characters were kind of floating in a limbo, this kind of neither here nor there, these characters that are always like trapped in a kind of... Um, no place you don't mm. know if you're here you don't know if you're there you don't know if you they don't have the right to work they don't have the right to be part of society so uh basically it, it's um it, it was uh every film has its own language every film has its own research every film has its own for, and for me for example those from the shore i knew i wanted to do something really suspended something very slow it was also to capture their waiting because they're waiting, mm. it can be one year, two years, three years. We were watching a film that's an hour and a half. So to show this waiting, for me, it was important to make this very suspended and slow film. And the mm. words are restricted because they have difficulty to speak. Because for mm. them, it was very difficult to kind of come out of their little cocoon that they're stuck every day and they just keep their time waiting. They don't enjoy life in Marseille. They don't go out and do tourism. They, uh, when I went out into their homes, they live in like small places with window closed, curtains closed. And I was like, open, come on, there's put some sun into your homes. No, they were quite hmm. restrained. But I understand because th th there's not much light in their life. There's not much colors in their life. And the, that's why there's this distance. There's also... Um, uh, the, this kind of way to respect the fact that they didn't want to talk much. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> Village of Women, I knew that it's not what I'm searching. I knew that I wanted to do another kind of documentary, even though I love those from the shore. I, I feel very attached to this film. But for me, there's a huge difference between those from the shore and Village of Women. Yes, yes. In a way, you can, I think you can know, if you know me, you can know that I made it, but it's so different. And I like mm -hmm. it because... I think for me, if I do the same film, and then it means that I don't have anything else to do. I want to do <laughs> change. I want to do. I want to search something new. I want to do something different, and that's yeah. why I'm all the time searching. And that's why Village of Women is much more uh, alive. Women are more colors, and it's very colorful film. Village of Women, and yeah. it's, um, there is joy, there is melancholy, there is crying, there is laughing, there is. Uh, and I knew that what I wanted with Village with Women was this. I was searching for this. But I know that my yes. next film, it's not this what I want. I want something else. <laughs> well, we'll wait for that. 
So yeah, let's talk a little bit about village of women, and we also have a question on that from uh, someone in the audience. It is truly, it's a very beautiful film, and it is a film with so much heart, like you've just described. It has joy, color, melancholy, everything in it, you know. Um, and you bring us these women. Uh, in you know with all their complex layers and it's not an easy thing to do that to just arrive in a space and to be able to get that kind no. of access build that kind of relationship that allows you to do that so um i wanted you to talk about that but maybe we can show everybody a little clip and uh, sure. then i'll also read you the question is kind of related to that so maybe we can see the clip and then you can talk about it I 
Vorsicht, Horace kommt an im Sandra. So the question from Juhi in the audience actually speaks, I think, to uh, even this extract or to the entire film. She asks, um, in Village of Women, there is this deep sense of melancholy and longing, but there was also this playfulness in the dancing of the characters. What was the idea behind documenting and bringing these moments uh, in the film? Um, well, you know, when I arrived to the village, um, I was really impressed by all these women and how uh, they take this kind of, in, how they endure this waiting uh, um, life without men with so much grace, joy, sadness. There was all this actually. And so for me, it was quite, when I came, when I first started this project and I was meeting all these women and these children and the grandparents and everybody, I understood that there's both actually there's a lot of joy there's a lot of sadness there's a lot of longing a lot of melancholy a lot of waiting a playfulness the kids it's they they, they spend their day dancing they have these youtube songs and they just dance they are happy i mean also at the same time they're very sad they, they have a lot mm. of uh, melancholy in them they carry it within so i felt from quite beginning that this is a film where i'm exploring actually this and that both. Uh, there, for example, in those from the shore, there is not much joy. There is yeah. not much playfulness. Uh, even when the children are talking or playing music, it's quite uh, low, quite sad, quite heavy. Here, you, and I, for me, as um, to a reply to Juhi, it, it was very clear that I wanted to capture all that because a life in a village is, is like this. And I'm here to make a documentary. So I wanted to take the maximum of all the elements that were there to put it into my film. And that's why how I kind of constructed the film. And what is maybe also interesting to note in this process, Village of Women is a film that I wrote after I shot, which is not, does, it doesn't happen always. Because I had ideas in my head. There were things that were clear. I want to do this, this and that. And then I had decided, I, I, I had a producer that was interested in the project and I and I said you know what I want to film because I already spent one year pre preparing talking to them creating this kind of um, confidence because there's a, it's a very intimate film so we took a lot of time to prepare to get to know each other and it's not only me who chose them they so, also chose me so you were you were there for a year before you actually started no filming. no no I was going and coming we were on the phone okay. I, I was in Paris no I was going okay. and coming I was talking on the phone keeping a contact trying to get to know each other spending few days there uh, you know yeah. just just to understand if they want to do this with me and if I want to do this with them because mm -hmm. it's not evident that you arrive in a city like in a, in a village like this and like okay I'm gonna shoot no it doesn't mm -hmm. function like this and then mm -hmm. even in the and then came the summer the summer where I wanted to film so I told my producer, all I want is a ticket to get Armenia and a bit of money to buy gifts for the kids. He said, you got it. And I went. I stayed for a month. And I didn't start shooting in the beginning. I, I took a lot of time also to establish this relationship to make it stronger, to understand what are we going to do? I'm here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm all alone. I work a lot alone. I have my camera, my sound, everything, my equipment, my tripod. And I started to film and they quite fast, they realized that what I was looking for was not a sensational film about the loneliness of women or something like this. No, I wanted really just to accompany their joy, their sadness, their life, their playfulness. Uh, so that's what I was looking for. And I started filming. And when I finished this summer, I went back to Paris. I took a month and I wrote the whole project. And then we got uh, the financing and everything. It was much easier after. But in the beginning, it was really like, like this: go, mm. go and film. So and obviously, I love doing time. This. My way of yeah, 
Yeah, no, I can see. I mean, that because obviously you've built a very good relationship and that's how we see them, you know, so freely with, uh, sharing their life with you. Um, so time obviously must have been one thing that helped. But uh, do you shoot mostly yourself? And do you think that that's a big part of, you know, what uh, contributes to the richness of your films? It was cutting. Can you see? Can you repeat the question? Do, do I shoot what? Yeah. Do you shoot always yourself? And do you think that that contributes to the way the films turn out? Instead of working uh, with I a shoot cinematographer. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I shoot a lot alone. I work a lot alone. But at some point, I always invite somebody in. Okay. Uh, Embers, I shot all alone. Uh, mm -hmm. Just the last scene of Embers, when we have the group uh, we're drinking for May 9th, I asked my friend to come and film. Uh, because I knew that I wanted to be part of them, so I uh, I needed somebody to film. Uh, those from the shore, I started alone, and then again, I invited the camera. I always, um, Village of Women, I was mostly alone. It's only mm -hmm. at the end where I, invi I invited um, a camera and the sound, because I knew that the relationship I had with the women was already strong enough to bring somebody mm. from exterior. Because the, these kind of films, you need to be really heart to heart, face to alone with them. You cannot yeah. come and suddenly talk about intimacy, suddenly talk about their feeling, their, their fear. There, there's so much is happening in them. And these are people who never saw a camera in their life. You cannot just yeah. go and, and no, I needed to be alone. Quite yeah. in the beginning, I knew I wanted to be alone and I needed to be alone, even if it was not easy at all. It was not easy on a daily basis. So sometimes I was tired. I was sometimes exhausted to be doing all, all, all alone. But fortunately, mm. I had the children who helped me a lot. But I think it's an added value, I think, for Village of Women that I was alone. I'm mm. sure if I was accompanied, it wouldn't be the same. No, that's yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I can imagine. I, I agree, yeah. There's a question from Sayam. Um, uh, the frames that have been shot look serene and full of solace as it happens. Um, while one when one is in chaos, uh, mm -hmm. so I think he's trying to say, say that uh, both. I mean, they look uh, even though there is chaos in the context, but the frames look uh, full of solace and they're serene. I want to know what was going on in your mind, or what mental state were you in while shooting these scenes. But what so, film are we talking okay. about? I'm imagining that he's talking about those from the show. Yeah, no? me too. I think it's about us from the show, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Because yeah. Other, it doesn't work for other films. Yes. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's an interesting question. What was going on in my mind and my mental state? <laughs> well, I, I think that um, Sanyam, uh, what would I say? Um, well, I think this is a moment uh, that when I started meeting the, the, the asylum seekers in Marseille, it was very disturbing. It was very disturbing because it's very, very uh, painful to see, uh, already it's painful to see people who suffer. But when you see somebody from your home suffer, suffering, it's, uh, it's, it's very painful. And uh, how those from the shore started also uh, when I was traveling and I was in uh, another city in uh, parentheses, I open in, in France, Lyon, in Lyon city. And how I, the idea came is um, I was walking and then I saw there were tents and people live in tents and children and men and women. And then um, suddenly I heard a child and then there was the mother saying, come, we're going to eat. And they were speaking in Armenian. And I was taken by the throat because I was like, oh, there are Armenians who live in the street. I mean, it's stupid because, of course, there's so many different nationalities who live in the street. I'm sure in India also you have people who live in the street, the poverty. I mean, it's everywhere. In, in Armenia, in uh, France today, I walk in Paris, there's so many people living in the street. But I was not used to it at the time. And I was uh, very much shocked by this and very much troubled. So there was a lot of trouble in me. There was a lot of trouble. There was a lot of sadness. There was a lot of anger because I was saying, why these people should be here? Why these people should be in this state? Uh, why have they left their homes? But that's why also I wanted to understand. And I started meeting them and we started becoming friends. And then now we are family. And until now, uh, 
several of them. We, they call me, we speak, I follow up with their life, they follow up with mine. And uh, yes, uh, I think I was in a very troubled, and I think you can feel it. You can feel it in the in the film. There was a lot of uh, anxiety, trouble, uh, disturbance. Yeah. Um, we are sort of uh, coming to the close of this conversation, but I did want to ask you one more question. I mean, none of the clips that we have uh, shared today have... Uh, uh, shown that, but music is important, I think, to you in your work. Um, mm. Particularly in Village of Women, it was really a very, very important element. So I thought, uh, and I remember you talking about this last year also a little bit. So I thought it'd be nice, given that this is about practice and filmmaking practice, if you could speak a little bit about that, that, you know, what is your process with music? And, yeah, um, music is very, very important for me. Um, for me, it's really like, it's not just um, because sometimes they say, oh, we add music to make it easier to watch a film. No, no I don't believe in that. Uh, for me, it's another layer. So if uh, image, sound, music, it's, it's all different layers that uh, com complete each other. Mm. Uh, the way I work, I work a lot with a composer. Her name is Cynthia Zaven. She's also Armenian from Lebanon. And uh, Cynthia has often, for example, for February 19, I don't know if you have seen my short film, February 19, when I was writing it, I told her about the idea and she wrote me a score in one night. Uh, Embers, it was also, uh, we, we work uh, quite early, actually. I share with her images and she gives me Im uh, sounds, she gives me notes, and then we share again. We work a lot. It's a process. Uh, those from the shore, I didn't work with Cynthia. Uh, there was this piece, the, the main piece that is used a lot in the film. It's from a composer, Charles Ives. Charles Ives, a modern uh, music composer, American, I guess. And uh, in, in, in this piece, I was so inspired. It, actually, it's my husband who made me listen to it quite early in the editing. And, and, I, and I, I thought it, it's, 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 the, it's part of the film. <laughs> And I put it, and then when Cynthia, I showed Cynthia the film, I said, so what would you like to add or change? She said, nothing. I don't touch it. It's done. Tamara, you did a great job. It's done. And the mm. um, image of women, it's also, I worked again with Cynthia. She composed music for it. So it it's quite early in the editing. I share images. She sends me ideas. I share again. It's a process uh, we construct together during editing. Mm. So you, it's over a long period of time. That's yes. really, I mean, and, I and usually I, I take a time to I take time to edit, uh, and that's what producers don't like it because it costs money. <laughs> but I, I say I don't want much money when I shoot, but I, I need to have time. I sh I edit around six months. I I do mm. stops. I I stop. Yeah. I edit for example three weeks, four weeks. I do stop two weeks, three weeks, and then I take again, and then I stop again. And because it's also, um, for me, I write in three steps. I write before, I write during the film, and I write in editing. It's, it's mm, a process. Yeah. I cannot yeah. just, uh, in this village of women, I had 88 hours of, of filming. 88 mm -hmm. hours, and the film is one hour and a half. So it yeah. takes time to look all that, to digest it, to give it absolutely. put it edit yeah absolutely thank you so much damara this has been um such a <laughs> such an interesting uh, conversation i'm going to take so much back from it uh, i don't know if you know this armenian uh, poet you know actually uh, in uh, 2019 just it's so it's so timely it was when i was about to travel to armenia uh, somebody in my sort of facebook timeline posted this poem by an armenian poet called um zahre yaldishyan am i saying it correctly it also known as zahrad and it's 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 a poem called a woman cleaning lentils and i just wanted to share a small bit out of that it's a, not a very long poem but um i won't read the whole thing because in some ways it um, it just evokes what, what I think that your films do, you know, uh, this combination of the mind and the heart coming together. And the poem is um, A Woman Cleaning Lentils. It says, mm -hmm. a lentil, a lentil, a lentil, a stone. A lentil, a lentil, a lentil, a stone. A green one, a black one, a green one, a black, 
a stone. A lentil, a lentil, a stone, a lentil, a lentil, a word. Suddenly, a word, a lentil, a lentil, a word, a word next to another word, a sentence. A word, a word, a word, a nonsense speech. Then an old song, then an old dream. I'm going to stop there. Um, there's a little bit more in the you poem. You should send me the name of the poet. I will send it to you. I'll send you the poem and the name. I don't know. Some Somebody really nice posted this for me just before I went to Armenia. So it was just really so timely. And I just feel that in some ways, how this poem with this uh, sort of economy of words is bringing so many ideas and feelings Absolutely. all together. You do the same with your film. So thank you so very much um, for this wonderful feast that you've given us at Urban Lens. And uh, we look forward to your next uh, feature and other work. And uh, Subhashri, over to you. Thank you so much. Hi. Um, it was really lovely uh, listening to you both, Samina and Tamara, and also the poetic end to it, I mean, literally a poetic end to it, apart mm. from uh, Tamara's films, which I do feel have this very strong poetic quality and which is what makes it so special. And something, Samina, that you said about her films, that her films actually open out the space to see actually what she's feeling. And it has so much heart, um, yeah. Yeah. apart from an intellectual argument that it's yeah. making. So um, we are looking forward to more works from you. And I think for me, um, um, I watched Village of Women earlier this year. And while curating, uh, all, some of us watched uh, the rest of your films, Tamara. And for me, it was really interesting, right? You encounter pieces of work, um, you know, and, and every single person creates their own meaning, you know, when they watch a film or read a book. And then to actually speak to the person and hear about what their journey is, is, um, is actually opens out the film in a certain way. So what I am going to do is go watch your films again. Uh, so thank you for uh, sharing what you did. And um, to our viewers also, um, the films are available uh, from today, which is 18 November to uh, 21st November. Do watch all films of Tamara that's screening at the festival. And uh, this is the end of this session. But uh, we meet tomorrow again um, at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, where we will be in conversation with um, Philip Schaffner. A German filmmaker who's the second person who's filmmaker in focus and uh, Philip Schepner will be in conversation with uh, Madhushri Datta and Nicole Wolf. So hope to see you all again tomorrow. Bye bye. Good night. <laughs>